as we talk about something very juicy, um, how the sisters deal with relationships and relationships and discernment, all things relationships tonight. As the years progress, I find that um, it's a little different. Not that I never see cute men anymore, but um, I know that there's another side of it too, and that is how I behave and how do I send off messages. So even though I might be really comfortable in acting a certain way, or I know um, I'm just joking around and I'm not uh, looking for someone to marry, or I'm not consciously flirting, I need to, to I kind of go through a self-talk and self-look and um, think, all right, how does that behavior look? If you're in serious discernment at some point, you're really you know, seriously discerning uh, with a community, or you feel pretty sure that God is calling you to, con to consecrated life, it's time to stop dating. It's kind of like having that boyfriend that you say, oh, we're together, but you know, we see other people. Uh, it's kind of in that vein. It's the, kind of the closest comparison that um, we can make. But as you know, you can't fully grow in an individual relationship if you're busy maintaining other significant relationships that are similar. What is harder and challenging for me is all the people that I've met outside of community like classmates, men and women that you've worked with, families, students, etc. People you've come to love and who love you. And you've been moving around, being missioned, and the older you get, the more people you know. And so for me, these relationships and friendship get kind of spotty. Uh, I try emails, sometimes phone calling, Facebook that I don't really have a lot of time for. And I guess what I think is my big consolation is that it's just an invitation to accept my human limits of time and energy and to believe that I can direct the energy of God's love to them in prayer and that that's life-giving too. Maybe it's even more life-giving than in person. As I've moved around to different places that some people have stayed connected to and others I haven't. It's like um, you know, you, in a sense, God raises up people in your life at the right time, and sometimes, because we move so frequently, sometimes I stay connected and sometimes I don't. So that's a kind of a hard thing. That love of God where I might have thought earlier on, oh, that cuts me off from people, it does the opposite. It makes um, people more available and me available to more people, too. I remember distinctly having a conversation with a guy I was dating my senior year, of college and just sitting in the car next to him and, and just kind of I prayed about it and I had you know wrestled like what is going on here and and I'd said to you know God to say you need to let me know when is the time when am I supposed to break the news to to this friend this boyfriend and I really at that point I could not keep myself from starting this conversation of you know, this part, uh, this romantic part of our relationship has to has to stop because my heart is somewhere else. And you know what he said? He he kind of chuckled almost and said, "I knew it. I knew it." The question for me becomes, how do I love deeply without subverting my vocation? My vocation to love non-possessively, without becoming emotionally dependent on someone or the on me and causing that other person suffering as well as myself. And a, a test for me, I've found, is whether I'm at peace with the person loving somebody else more than me. And I can only love someone really as I am. And if I believe that I am a vowed woman given to God in community, and that's the only way I really can honestly love. Can I discern? Can I become a sister uh, if I, I if I uh, my sexual orientation or I identify as lesbian or bisexual? And the answer is yes. And the reason is well, the reason is because uh, none of us comes to community to live celibate chastity because we identify as one or the other. Number one, um, the most important piece of that is that you understand yourself because if we don't understand what our sexual desires are, what our attraction is, then we could struggle living celibate chastity. 
the thing that we're all called to is celibate chastity. And every single person, whether we're heterosexual, whether we're homosexual, whether we're bisexual, we're going to struggle with living that. And that's why this talk about relationships and how we live our relationships as daughter of daughters of charity is really important. Because no matter what, it's a struggle. It's more of a struggle if you don't understand your own identity, your own attraction levels, and the situations that could you know, bring you some pain and suffering or get you into um, some situations that could challenge or even, even you know, cause you to, to um, struggle against your celibate chastity. If I'm just going to be like locked tight like a door that's shut and people can't get in, well, God can't get in either. So, you know, sisters tend to be really attractive people because we're generally we're generous people, we're out there serving people, we're trying to be charitable. But those are all really good qualities. So it's it's not, as Sister Hamora said, it's highly likely that people are going to be attracted to us. So then, so then it becomes a question of learning at a deep level who I am, and who I belong to, and how I'm going to move forward. So that those they are it's a really, really wonderful learning experience to fall in love can be deeply painful but you know, I think God can work with it with us. And you know we don't um, we don't typically wear makeup a lot at all and so <laughs> our, our skin tends to be really beautiful for a long, long time. <laughs> Every, I'm not surprised people fall in love with us, but you know, uh, our hearts are open, right? 